started. Great, thanks. Thank you and welcome to the meeting of East Lothian Integration Joint Board and um, this meeting has been recorded and will be made available as a webcast in order to allow the public access to the democratic process in East Lothian. East Lothian Council and NHS Lothian are the data controllers under the Data Protection Act 2018. The data collected as part of the recording will be retained in accordance with the Council on Health Board's policies on record retention. The webcast of this meeting will be publicly available for up to six months. And now we'll do a roll call of attendees and any apologies. Thank you, Chair. Um, we have apologies today from David <clears throat> Binney and also apologies from Elizabeth Gordon and George Gordon is here in her place. I'll now do the roll call of attendees. Um, Shamine Akhtar. Present. Lachlan Bruce. Pre present. Thank you. Lynn Jardin. Present. Thank you. Carol McFarlane. Nope. Andrew Cogan. Present. Thank you. George Gordon. Present. Thank you. Fiona Ireland. Present. Peter Murray. Present. Maureen Allen. Present. David Aston. Present. Lindsay Byrne. Present. Thank you. Philip Conaglin. Present. Lorreen Cowan. Present. Thank you. Claire Flanagan will be joining us later. Wendy Hale. Nope. And I think is Claire McDonald with us just now? If not, she might be joining us later on. Um, Claire McIntosh. Present. Thank you. Marilyn McNeil. Present. Thomas Miller. Present. Thank you. And Fiona Wilson. Present. That's the roll call of attendees. Um, can I ask if any members have any declarations of interest to make? Nope, that's great. We're ready to start the business, Chair. Thank you. And just before we start, I just want to welcome all the people that are substituting and also to welcome our um, new service rep representatives and um, David Aston, who's here and Marilyn, who's, who's rejoined. So welcome. Welcome to the meeting, David. Um, we'll go on to agenda item number one, which is the minute of the last meeting from the 25th of May. And um, could we have a general approval of, of minutes? You agreed it's an accurate. Yeah, agreed. Agreed, thank Agreed. you. Move on to agenda item two, which is matters arising from minutes from the 25th of, of May. Do you have any matters arising on page one? Page two? Page three? Page four? Page five, page six, and page seven. There's, there's no matters arising. Okay, thank you. Move on to um, agenda item three, which is the chair's report. Um, I just wanted to cover a, a few things. As I'd mentioned at the last meeting, I've started um, meeting with IGIB members. Um, and if I haven't met you, I'll be making our um, our rounds in over the next few months, and um, just to to find out, get feedback from you of what you feel is working well, and what could be improved. So I'll I will be in touch with you. And um, I think some of the feedback that we've had so far is looking at our development sessions and how we can focus on the the directions, and um, on on and the finances in a bit more detail. And I think that'll be helpful for new members, but also to refresh for um, IJB members that have on been for, for a while. And um, a couple of things I wanted to touch upon. Um, I had the opportunity to attend was the East Lothian Rehabilitation Service and it produced its very first annual report and the team had a really successful launch of its report at Queen Margaret University and um, so I just want to um, 
thank all the team for that. I think it's it, helpful just to reflect that it's a 141 staff across a partnership um, and across four work streams. They, um, just to touch upon, they've had 60,236 interventions and appointments and the single point of contact phone line handled 29,478 calls and there was quite um quite a lot of detail and significant work um happening around um using digital technology to support um to, to, to support people so it was a really detailed report and I know that's been sent out so just to congratulate um Leslie Berry and her team for um for for that launch and it just showed the significant amount of work that's happening across the partnership to to support people in our local community. So, for example, in the report, you'll see lots of next steps for the work that's being carried out, for example, around um, mental health and, and looking at work with MGP referral pathway. So I would highly recommend having a, a look through the through the report. Um, it was also Carers Week, so I met with staff of Carers of East Lothian and carers from uh, across the county at one of their events and just went around to get feedback and um, just to find out about the levels of support they were receiving and um, and the overall feedback was that they thought that the partnership staff were working well in, in providing them with support. And I think that's testament to the work that Maria is going to be talking about in the Carers Strategy as we move on. Um, I also went along to, I know other colleagues did as well, to the Food Bank AGM and their referrals have increased year on year. Last year they had 6,980 requests for support and that's supporting 16,746 people were supported um, and they are doing quite a lot of work around supporting individuals with long term conditions and support that are coming to see them for referrals with the Citizens Advice Bureau. So that'd be an area of work that possibly for us to, to link into and to, to support people. Um, our meetings with the day centres um, continues and some of the feedback you'll see reflected in the papers and the work that Christine Johnson's been doing in, their, in her ongoing engagement with, with the day centres um, that's, that's been happening. So that was really positive um, to get feedback from them and to see all the out, outreach work that they are carrying out, just to increasing their reach in the local community to support people. And um, we also had a meeting with the Care and Repair Board and we heard about the work that they're doing and the impact um, that it's having on individuals on getting people home as quickly as possible. On sometimes it's minor adjustments to their homes, it may be a key fob, etc., um, and getting them um, back into their homes as quickly as possible. But also we heard about the financial challenges that they're they're facing. Um, and a couple of final external things I wanted to mention. The um, we've been working with our representative body, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities, who has been working with government on the dementia. Um, dementia strategy and that's something that um, Christine Johnson and Sue Northup from East Dementia Friendly East Lothian had the opportunity to feed into um, that national policy. Um, the, na the work on the National Care Service, as you know, had been delayed and that still continues and the removal of the charging, um, which is supposed to happen during the duration of the Parliament and we've been following that up through the work that Laura Kerr has been doing, that nothing will be happening between 23-24 because um, we wanted to find out for, for East Lothian constituents um, when when the when there would be the removal of the non-residential um, charges, but nothing will be happening over the, over the year ahead, so the policy has been updated and, and circulated. Okay. Um, Peter, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to touch upon. Uh, thanks, Rhys. Just two very quick things. Um, I would point people towards a report that was issued this morning called Realistic Medicine Doing the Right Thing. It's the Chief Medical Officer's annual report. And the reason I highlight it uh, is that it's got four themes. And one of the themes is health inequalities turning the tide. So um, I think there's some interesting commentary in that. And there's also another section on value-based healthcare. So I'm sure that some of you will be interested to read that. And second quick thing, she mean thanks for the opportunity to, to say this. Um, you may recall that there was a paper produced by the Chief Officers on the financial pressures that uh, Scottish IGBs in general are feeling. I think the sum total was something in the order of 305 million. Uh, that they felt they were short of providing the services that ideally they, they would have provided during this year. Um, as the chairs and vice chairs group, we have decided that we're going to work with the chief officers to examine the impact of that reduction in year, if we can, to see if there's anything uh, re reportable that's of value for us as we engage with Scottish Government, because um, clearly they may have some influence in the budgetary setting for 24-25. 
uh, each loading will be part of that, clearly, as we uh, start to assess the effects of the reduction in uh, budget. Thank you, Shireen. OK, thank you. I don't know if anybody's got any questions. What we'll do, Peter, is make sure we circulate those reports that you've mentioned that have come out this morning, because I think that'll be useful for for members to to have. OK, but if, if anybody does have anything, then, you know, get 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 in touch with us and we're happy to pick up on any of the issues that we've we've touched upon. OK. Move on to agenda item number four, which is the East Lothian Integration Joint Board Annual Performance Report, and that's going to be presented by Claire. Uh, Claire sends her apologies. She's uh, unable to be here today, so you have me presenting it. So um, I, I, I'm trying to deliver it as well as Claire, but um, uh, uh, let, let's see how we go. So I, I suppose I'm just really pleased to present the annual report for 22-23, which shows the continued success and the impact East Lothian Health and Social Care Partnership is having in delivering health and social care services. Um, Claire Goodwin has provided this detailed report um, and will do a summary report, but we're looking for um, the IGB to review the report and in doing so recognise the achievements of the partnership and individual services during 2023, 22 to 23 and commend the contribution made by staff, volunteers and partner organisations throughout the year. Note that there will be changes to the National Integration Indicators data once the final data set is published by Public Health Scotland at the start of July and that a final version of the, of the annual performance report incorporating any changes will be sent to IGB members for information prior to the publication at the end of July. And while we recognise that there's no requirement within the statutory guidance for IGBs to formally sign off on this, it is requested that IGB members give approval. We think this is important for the publication of 22-23 uh, annual uh, performance report as appended, subject to any of the minor changes that I've illustrated uh, um, through my comment. And I'll just pause there for any questions. Thank you, Fiona. Can I ask if anybody has any, any questions? Peter? Yeah, can I make two comments, please? Um, Shabin, uh, one, I think it's an excellent report. I think it's easy to read, it's very informative, and uh, I'd like to pass on my thanks to those that have compiled it. My question um, is not answerable necessarily today, but going forward, it would be it would be helpful to see that there's a correlation, as I'm sure there is, but maybe to spell out a bit clearer between the directions that we have established and the work contained within this very good report. But it's only a plea to perhaps just affirm the relationship that I'm sure exists, but if we could just demonstrate that, I think it would give us even more uh, clarity on the role of the IGB and this very good work that's captured within this report. OK, thank you, Peter. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Fiona. Yeah, I, 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 um, thank you, uh, Peter. I absolutely recognise what you're saying and just that a tighter relationship with the directions that has been commented at other other points and I think that's something we want to draw into to the IGB and and it's recognised in the report so thanks I'll, I'll feed that back uh, but going forward thank you. Okay thank you and um, Lynn and then Andrew. Thank you Shanine. Um, I'm conscious that I have read this report which is absolutely brilliant um, with a bit of a critical eye um, and I'm wondering if I've got a number of um, sort of comments, observations. Um, is it too late to feed those through um, in terms of how some of it sits where I think we might be use, useful to, to answer some other questions or just those sort of how do we, some bits I think might benefit from possibly a, a bit more linkages or or um, connections with other areas, for instance? Um, so I I don't think so as my answer, but I, I don't know. Um, but I'm keen that we get your comments because if, if there's anything, if we can't adjust it for this year, we want to take that learning for, for next year. So is it possible we could just get the comments and then I have that pick up with Claire? Because um, there will be minor adjustments being able to be made I just do in the context of the comments, uh, just how that app fits. Um, so is that possible to do? Yeah, I think sure. I, mean, I, can, I can send I it on. I've, I've kind of got them Perfect. where they, they relate to, so I'll, I'll forward that on to Claire. No Perfect. problems. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Um, Andrew? 
just a quick last couple of points as as a new member of the board it was really great to read that report he gave gave a fantastic overview of um, of services uh it, it, it particularly it it's it, demonstrated the really really good and innovative work and and i need to understand more about the core services that's not a criticism of the report it is i need to develop my understanding so it, it kind of it was it was a great about all of the innovative and great work but i maybe maybe i'm missing something in all of the papers but about what the, the core services may, maybe need maybe not in this report but for my understanding so that was just an observation i echo all the the comments about how well written it is and how well it's pulled together my only observation is it, it is and this is again maybe my newness there's lots of hints around great work that's taking place using digital and digital technology and innovation but i didn't I didn't see a strand across all of the work streams that says oh, we are taking digital and digital innovation forward across the range of services. So maybe that's something not for today, but to reflect upon. And, and I would like to you know, see how we can do that because it, there's hints, but I think there's more that we could maybe do as a board to promote the use of digital, digital technology innovation across the full range of services rather than maybe an in individual snippets of services. Can I come back in, Chair? Yeah. Perfect. Um, no, that, that's really helpful. And, and I think it's similar to Councillor Darden's um, points just around, you know, I've got some that critical friend, critical eye comment. So if there's stuff that we, we need to pull out and we can't, and I see Laura has now joined us, so she maybe has a, a view on, on how much um, we can change around the report, but we need to think about that next year. I think that's really important. Um, I suppose a couple of things is if there's stuff that you're picking up from the annual performance report and you want to know more about or we need to do a bit of a development session on, please be in touch. Don't don't sit quietly and think, ah, you know, I want to know more about this. That the, the whole point of it is just to shine a light on what we do, but also develop understanding around what we do as well. And I suppose I'm just thoughtful. Um, colleagues and, and I met with a uh, Scottish government yesterday just around some of the work going on in East Lothian and and they made a they made a similar point around there's lots of good work going on but how do we just make sure that is um demonstrated nationally so people know so it, I guess it's just how a balance of how do we celebrate this as well as and let other people know how do we um kind of educate people further and 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 develop that interest as well as picking up how can we maybe improve it next year or um, uh, going forward. So yeah, really, really helpful comments and I, I really I appreciate that. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Do we have any other comments or questions? No, Fiona, could I ask that you'd said there was going to be national indicators. Do we have any influence on any of the indicators if we feel um, particular ones would be more pertinent for us in East Lothian? Um, I'll, I'll defer to Laura because I see she's here. My understanding is no, but I'm sure she'll be quick to correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. No is the answer. So the yeah. national indicators are already set and they are yeah, what the Scottish government look at um, for all areas. So we, we just get that information back. OK, and one area that we've talked about before, and um, because what you're doing is uh, as IJB reflect in the work of the health and social care partnership is how we reflect the contributions of the other partners and I know we've talked about how we reflect the contributions of the volunteer and community sector because I'm just particularly focusing on what is in this year's report that wasn't here last year things like the the community first um, and how we how we reflect that through it um, and I just wondered if there was any um, any other intelligence from from VCL Maureen or your dashboard that would highlight that you know it is a genuine partnership in trying to make sure we achieve our directions. I'm happy. I mean, if somebody can send me what they would like me to to contribute to. I mean, we did, as you see, I mean, we've got the dashboard. We're doing another piece of work on a different uh, piece of software, and we're also obviously got the, the community first numbers. But obviously, the commissioners, as they, as they, the partnership, have that information as well. But I'm happy to to contribute next year if you think that would be worthwhile, and probably around about the volunteer and stuff as well. We can yeah. probably bring more information in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's grand. 
Was there, I don't think there is any other other questions. I think this is an area. It's a really, really important report, and um, probably something that we could spend the whole meeting going going through and going through with with the staff. But I think, um, as you've said, it's already been mentioned. We have to make sure how we're um, recognizing it and making sure that staff are are getting the the acknowledgement for the hard work. So, for example, I think. Um, page after page is transforming community services. There's been a, a wealth of work that's gone on. I, I know mostly from having met Christine through the day centre network um, that's going on behind behind the scenes in the meeting centres, which we'll see later on, for example, establishing one in, in, in Musselburgh. So there's a um, huge amount of work and also the new the new services like Community First and the Teens Plus um, project based in um, Musselburgh for you for and young people in transitions, they would normally be attending in Edinburgh. So Teens Plus, um, Shannon and her team, we have a Teens Plus established in Musselburgh. So young people are able to stay within the county to, to get that level of, of support who are, who are maybe on the communications or autism and, and learning disability spectrum. Um, but I think if if we leave this with yourself, um, Jennifer, of um, pulling out key things and, and looking at how we make sure um, there's, there's different ways of, of getting recognition for, for staff, um, but also how we're picking up the learning from each of those areas as well, so that we can feed that in for how, how we see improvement for, for next year. Okay, I don't see any other hands up or any comments or, or questions. Nope. On this one, um, we do require a roll call um, vote. So if I could pass over to you, Fiona. Thank you. Um, yep. The recommendations are as set out at 2.1, 2.2 and 2.3. Um, Shamin Akhtar. Support. Thank you. Lachlan Bruce. Lachlan. Not sure if he's with us. Andrew Cogan. Yep, support. Thank you. George Gordon. Support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fiona Ireland. Support. Lynn Jardin. Support. Um, is Carol with us now? Has she joined yes. the meeting? Oh, Carol, thank you. Are you happy to support? Yes. Thank support. you. Peter Murray. Support. Thank you. Um, Lachlan, are you able to unmute your mic? No. OK. Um, subject to getting um, Lachlan's vote, that's the recommendations approved unanimously. OK. OK, thank you, Fiona. Move on to um, agenda item number five, which is a carer strategy with Maria Burton. Hi there. Um, I'm just going to give a wee bit of background about how the strategy was developed first. Um, so the Carers Act is still the most significant piece of legislation around carers' rights and the Scottish Government provide funding to health and social care partnerships to support its implementation. Um, the Health and Social Care Partnership invests this funding in community support with the aim of improving the lives of unpaid carers who offer kind of absolutely invaluable support to people who couldn't cope without it. Um, the strategy presented is East Lothian's second local carer strategy and it builds upon the work that has been done over the last few years to improve carer support. It was brought together following a programme of consultation with carers and carers groups and um, other representatives and it sets out the plans to improve support over the next three years. Um, the draft was shared widely for public consultation and the SPG have had the opportunity to comment on it as well. The strategy outlines priorities for carer support under seven outcomes and the implementation plan shows what will be done to work towards these goals. And the first step and therefore the first outcome is always the carer identification for someone to access the support that's available. They have to recognise that the support they're giving to a vulnerable person makes them a carer. And once they do that recognition, they can then have access to the information and advice that will help them continue in their role. The Health and Social Care Partnership commissioned services to provide this for both adult and young carers. Um, support should enable carers to maintain their own well-being, um, both physically and mentally, and to achieve a balance between caring and other aspects of their lives. For example, if they want to stay in work or if they're wanting to keep up with other relationships that are important to them. 
they are offered an adult carer support plan which supports their good conversation to work out what matters most to them and what support might be needed to meet personal outcomes. One of the continuing priorities within the strategy is to ensure carers are able to access breaks to do the things that they enjoy and to rest. Um, under the National Care Service or proposed National Care Service, this will become a legal right and significantly the advice is that we are working towards that now, not waiting for any legislation to come into place. Local authorities will have a duty to provide breaks from care in where it is an identified need and this will be the case whether people meet our local eligibility criteria or not. One of the issues that carers highlight around breaks from caring is the availability of services to support these breaks. The Health and Social Care Partnership has more to do to support carers to access these breaks and also to encourage and diversify the market for short breaks. We need to make more options available to people. There's been a lot of work in this area already through the Community Transformation Programme and as has been mentioned, the work with the Older People's Day Centres most recently to um, to make their blended model of um, building based and community based support. There are also improvements to be made for carers to build support through SDS. Carers need to be recognised as partners and experts in care and we've seen from the new uh, national dementia strategy that they've su suggested adopting the term care partner, recognising um, that the carer is very much a, a part of the support and they will be taking that campaign forward. As well as being involved in planning of care for the person they care for, the carer should also be involved in any design and delivery of local services. There's wider awareness raising work for us to be doing in local communities so that everyone recognises the role of carers and can support them to feel valued and stay connected. Campaigns like the Health and Social Care Partnership ran over Carers Week will help raise awareness, but work is also needed with local groups and businesses to recognise the role of unpaid carers. The funding information is included for your interest and to show where investments are being made towards meeting the outcomes. New initiatives and proposals to extend current projects will be considered over the course of the year by the Carers Change Board and funds will be utilised to support the delivery of the strategy to increase provision of breaks from caring and in other ways to support the stated aims. The Carer Strategy is intended to support and assist in the delivery of the IJB Strategic Plan and its associated directions. Directions in relation to the carer strategy will be updated once the new policy is agreed by the IGB. I'll pause there to allow for questions and then hand back to the chair for the recommendations. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. Do we have any questions or comments for her? George? More a comment. Um, obviously, I've seen a lot of two IJBs. What was particularly pleasing about reading the, the, this paper and the strategy is the amount of uh, groups and organisations that were widely consulted. I thought that was really excellent. And I think that came through with the actual report as well. So I just want to commend you on that. I think it's an excellent piece of work. Thanks, George. Emily? Um, likewise, I wanted to commend the, the work that's been put into this and also the the recognition and you said it yourself there um, yeah, about the the role, the incredibly valuable role that carers play in delivering what we all want to see in society as, as us being a, a, a caring and kind society and being able to, to, to manage to include everyone as best as possible. And I think that concept of seeing carers as partners is absolutely critical in going forward. Um, I did have one question um, in relation to the comparison between East Lothian and the national averages. The gender split of carers seems to be that we've got a, a higher proportion of females than nationally. Um, obviously, I, I've, unfortunately, I've not had time to go through the entire equalities impact or the the integrated impact assessment but I just wondered if there was anything that we'd picked up from that 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 made a difference to how our strategy goes forward. Um, no that's not something I picked up through the um, integrated impact assessment or anything um, that our figures were particularly different. I think um, yeah it's long been recognised that that there's much more of a role or women take much more of a role in unpaid caring but um, no I need to look into the the differences between that and the national average, yeah. 
It wasn't to ask you to do anything else. It was just if you had, that's okay. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, is that all right, Lynn? Okay. And Peter and then Marilyn? Yeah, um, likewise with colleagues, I want to recognise the good work that this um, presents to us. Uh, my question relates to reporting. Uh, Maria, uh, obviously I can see the tables about outcomes and all the various expectations that you've got that places quite a significant challenge ahead of you, I suspect, and I'm just checking that uh, you're confident we've got the capacity, the funding's right, and I suppose the line of sight for the IGB. What's your thoughts on that as we go forward? Because obviously the reporting to WHO column um, doesn't feature much if any of the IGB, so are you going to aggregate that up at some point or what's your thinking along those lines? I think what we put within the strategy that we were going to um, report annually on the um, implementation plan to the some of the carers groups, um, particularly the carers voice panel at Carers v Slothian, but also report on progress to the SPG, um, and that can be um, moved up if if people think that's necessary. But that's the kind of current arrangements. Shamika, come back on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you, Maria, I think that's a, that's 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 obviously um, a sensible, but I suppose. The highest risk is in probably the um, capacity to deliver, and I think it would be helpful just to be confident that your assessment of the capacity uh, against the timelines that you've met or you, you hope to meet um, are being achieved. And I, for one, would, would particularly like to see that reported back to the um, IGB at some point, just to make sure that the funding arrangements as we go into the second year of planning are in keeping with the capacity requirements to, to bring it to life as you would want it to be brought to life. We can do that, yeah. Okay, Laura, did you want to come in on this one? Yeah, if that's okay, it was just, yeah. I think, recognising that there is, Peter, you're right, that resource issue, so particularly around respite, where we want to purchase different forms of respite, but it's getting the resource available and the staff available to deliver that support. And I think that's something we really struggle with and sort of looking at different ways of doing it um, to try and deliver outcomes when the services aren't really there. Um, so it's certainly something that we monitor and look at through the, the change board and adjust our um, kind of plans based on, on what is actually deliverable and on the, the finances that we have available. Just uh, as a kind of reassurance, the finances for um, the carers um, or the Carers Act monies are uh, monitored very closely by the change board. Um, we have um, meetings set up um, prior to the change board and then finance colleagues attend the change boards to go down just on the, the, de the detail of the spend um, because it is a significant amount of money um, and we will have a direction set against it. So just that kind of reassurance that that is being monitored. But yes, resource and capacity to deliver is a struggle. OK, thanks, Laura. And Marilyn? Marilyn, you're, you're, the mute button's on. Sorry, Shamine. I'm just aware of uh, a couple in which the um, the wife realises now that she's been, caring, been a carer for her husband for the past six months or so and, and wants to move forward getting some support, but he is reluctant to do that. And I'm just wondering whether that is a barrier that um, comes up frequently and is there any mechanism, is there any support for the carer? I guess I don't mean to really say legally because you'd hope it wouldn't come to that, but um, any any mechanism to help the carer in respect to this? Yeah, I think him um, probably carers of East Lothian would be the best people and to advocate on the carers' behalf, and they would certainly get involved. That it definitely is something that comes up, and the difficulty. Um, I mean, you can't put depending on people's capacity, you can't put services in where the person is not in agreement. You know, it is, it, but it is a common problem, and I think they will be experienced at maybe helping the carer approach those conversations and see how they can get on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any other questions or comments for Maria? I don't see any other ones. Maria, you make a really important point in, in one of the papers of that um, it's everybody's responsibility, every partner's um, 
re responsibility and do you feel in the work that you're doing you are getting the level of support that you require from partners or to be able to um, try and do things um, differently for example especially in um, providing respite opportunities? Uh, yeah I think um, the thing of providing respite opportunities is a is a serious resource issue as Laura says kind of along with the general um, kind of lack of of availability of care um, but um, people are very aware of the need and the change um, I think we've highlighted at SPG before the kind of change in the availability of respite particularly for older people so yeah I think the support is there yeah. Okay and I just wondered if we're looking at um, if, if we're struggling others will be in a similar position mm -hmm. if there are other um, examples or different ways to be able to to deliver it. Yeah, from, definitely. From other but authorities or other places. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of work just now working out what um, other local authorities are doing. And I think the way that a lot of people are approaching it is by using budgets differently. So people might be um, given a respite budget, but they, um, a lot of people have started employ, um, employing staff in a kind of different role, like an SDS enabling role, where the person will be awarded that budget after their assessment, and then they will support them to look at how they might spend that in a slightly different way if, if kind of resources aren't available for kind of residential respite or the kind of typical what people think of respite. And, and there's a huge shift to be made in terms of um, people thinking of that residential respite towards the short breaks and looking at what actually meets the need for the person rather than kind of going straight to that residential kind of support, although it's a very important part of it. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Um, sorry, Marilyn, just realised you've still got your hand up. Did you want to come back in? It's a legacy hand. Sorry about that. OK, that's OK. I don't think there's any other um, comments or questions from 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 anybody else. I do want to pass on. I know um, having um, spoken to um, David Binney, who's our carers representative, I know he's not here today, but I know throughout the year he really has been commending, Maria, your work, especially around the engagement with carers of East Lothian and engagement with, with carers groups and carers themselves in taking forward the strategy. So it's gen, uh, there's a, a genuine partnership and that people are seeing their voices re re reflected in here. So I know I wanted to pass that feedback from, from him um, that he really did um, see that it was a really significant um, piece of work that he could see that you're really actively going out to engage with groups, which is really important that that's a, a, a genuine carer strategy, not just in its words, but in, in the work that's going on in the background. So just to thank you for that. Okay, Thank you. but I think we, we uh, just to reflect the comments that we that, that we made. It's it's a really important part of our our directions, and we that we want to be looking at everything that we're doing to support and being as imaginative and creative as possible, as you've said, Mira, with budgets. But um, that carers within East Lothian make a significant con contribution and support um, within East Lothian, and it's really important that we acknowledge that and value that. And I think the work that you've carried out over Carers Week as well, um, but one of the things is that Carers Week shouldn't be Carers Week, should be Carers Day every day, that we're thinking about that in all our areas of work of what we're doing um, to, to support carers. So thank you for that, Maria, and everybody else that's been involved in this, this piece of work. Okay, um, we require a roll call for this, so I'll pass on to Fiona. Thank you, Chair. The recommendation is um, set out at uh, 2.1 in the report to approve the draft strategy and to note the funding for 23-24. Um, Shemin Akhtar? Agreed. Lachlan Bruce? Lachlan, are you there? Looks like his connection is not very good. Sorry, oh, you I are there. managed to get it on mute. Sorry, it's support. Thank you. And can I just confirm um, item four? Are you happy to support the recommendations yes. there as well? Thank you. Yeah, apologies for that. That's OK. Um, Andrew Cogan. Agreed. Um, George Gordon. Agreed. Fiona Ireland. Agreed. Lynn Jardin. Agreed. Harold McFarlane. Agreed. And Peter Murray. Agreed. Thank you. That's the recommendation approved unanimously. Thank you, Fiona. Move on to agenda item six, which is East Lothian Health and Social Care Partnership Commission Community Support 23-24. And is that with yourself, Christine? It is. Thanks, Shamine. Um, yes, yeah, so the paper sets out the proposed budget and commissioning arrangements for 
commissioned community support. But just to highlight, there's a significant other commissioning that takes place. So, for example, through the Carers Act funding that Maria has just referred to, through learning disability and, and the mental health budget. So those are not included in this paper. This is specifically for the voluntary sector um, budget. So just by way of background, then obviously we commission in a, in a variety of ways, sometimes through open tender process, sometimes through grants or direct awards. That's informed by the contract value or the procurement regulations that we need to consider. But where possible, we take as light a touch as we can. And our whole approach is obviously underpinned by the commissioning strategy that was approved by IJB earlier in the year. And the key shift for that is really commissioning for outcomes. So what difference is this going to make to the people of East Lothian? So in the paper, we've, there's a number of principles highlighted as well around local services, prevention and innovation. And again, that focus on personal outcomes. So I'm not going to go through all the details of the funding, um, but I'll highlight a few um, from the appendices in particular. So the first one um, I'll highlight is Community First. So that was a service that actually was commissioned to start and did start in October 22. So we're now in our first full year of that um, that commissioned service that's provided by Volunteer Centre East Lothian. And that's really a key service in enabling us to deliver a new community model of support, um, supporting people to live locally and in their homes for as long as possible. And that's also um, aligned with the hospital discharge support service. So that's a key service. Another one that we've commissioned is the post-diagnostic support service for people with dementia. So that was awarded through a tender process to um, Alzheimer's Scotland. But within that process, we've ensured that they're going to develop their own approach to community models, and um, which is important. You'll see in Appendix 1 that there's three organisations that were funded in 22-23, and they were funded for one year only. Um, those organisations have not sought funding from the partnership going forward. They, the organisations are McMary Men's Shed, Sporting Memories Foundation and the Penny Pit Development Trust, but we're aware that those, those organisations have been successful in getting funding from other sources. So moving on to the housing support, which is in Appendix 3, so you'll be aware that housing support isn't delegated to IJB, but for historical reasons, it's still sitting within our budget. So we're going to work with colleagues um, in the housing department this year to try and transfer that over. But for this year, the funding is set out within the paper for Blue Triangle, for NCH and for the housing support element of Women's Aid. There's also a, a related review of the Women's Aid services to do with the Violence Against Women and Girls agenda, and that's been um, considered by the, the, the Chief Social Work Officer. The other small point on housing support is that, that we no longer fund the Abbey Field North Berwick um, Trust because that's been incorporated into Blackwood Housing Association. So under 3.5, we've got um, a point about commissioning arrangements for East Lothian Sexual Abuse Service. So that's not housing support service. It's a service provided by Edinburgh Rape Crisis, and it's been funded through the Council, One Partnership Fund, and MELDAP, Mid and East Lothian Drug and Alcohol Partnership. They've asked us to look in the partnership about taking the lead on that commissioning arrangement. So they're funding it for this year, and we'll be looking at how we can commission that for 24 and 25. Moving on to the day centres, which we've referred to already, um, their proposed budget set out in Appendix 2. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with the day centres to put them on a commissioning arrangement where they've got longer term funding. A lot of that is focused on improvement work around their governance arrangements, their business planning, the quality framework, and grateful for the support of VCEL in supporting that process as well. The services have continued to provide really high quality support for older people with complex needs. Um, going forward, a key change is that we've managed to secure funding for a new day centre in Musselburgh which has been a significant gap. And um, we're going to commence the design process, working with the community about what that service will look like. So for the purposes of the budget, we've assumed that the earliest that that service would start would be January 24. So we've allowed for one quarter in this budget, but we have um, considered for future years, we've got the full allocation for that service going forward. The other small point about the day centres is they have their association, which is a representative forum for the day centres, which does um, a lot of support um, for the trustees. They have no requirement for funding this year. They've managed to save a lot of costs and have a significant amount in reserve. So we're not proposing to fund them this year. We'll review it for next year. And in 3.7, 
we've highlighted some services and providers that we're proposing to give a, a slight uplift to. So the seven organisations listed, they're not entitled to the Scottish Government uplift for adult social care because they don't provide direct care, they don't meet that criteria. Therefore, we've proposed um, an uplift as outlined in the paper. So um, the final point I would make is that all of this commissioning work is done with a huge amount of engagement, always with carers, with providers, with communities, and that underpins all the kind of work that we've done. So the proposals um, in the recommendations are to, to note the, the budget and agree the uplifts that I've mentioned, um, note the Older People's Day Centre um, budget and the inclusion of Musselburgh. The, the the issue regarding housing support transferring and the issue about the Abbey field no longer being funded. And then finally, the short term funding arrangements for East Lothian. So happy to um, pass back to uh, the chair for any uh, questions or discussion. Thanks very much, Christine. That's a huge amount of work that you've covered there. Can I just open up for any questions or comments for Christine? Peter? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Shamir. Thanks, uh, Christine. Really helpful uh, report and detail. Uh, I've got a couple of questions if I can. Uh, 3.6, if I read that correctly, in that you're providing a guarantee of funding over seven years with a split between three, two, and two, where there'll be a kind of measure taken of the quality of the services provided at that point. Is that how it's going to work? That's right. So we'll look to have, um, that's what we're trying to do with a lot of our commissioning is to have longer term arrangements in place. So we have a break point at the three years where we'd have a formal contract review and, and then assess whether we are we want to continue for an additional two two years and then we'd have that that process repeated after another two years but within that whole time frame uh, myself and colleagues will still be supporting the day centers with a quarterly review so we're really keen that we have those quarterly meetings and informal discussions so we're capturing any issues earlier on rather than leaving it say for six months or 12 months so so you can be assured there's a lot of quality assurance work built in to the process and a lot of development work that vcell are going to be supporting us on um across across the work that they all do. Well, well, I very much welcome both those answers. So thank you, uh, Christine. I think we should give certainty of funding, but equally, I think we should expect, as you just described, the quality to remain as we would anticipate. I've got a couple more screens that I'll give a carry on. Yes. Yeah. Um, I noticed that some of the uplifts uh, in my very poor maths would represent about 4% of an increase where the increase has taken place. Has that been an assessment made in conjunction with them, or is that just what we can afford? I suppose my anticipation is that a 4% rise in any service provision, taking salaries into account, is going to be quite tight. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I think that I would go for all the providers that we're talking and setting budgets for. We absolutely accept the context that they're operating in, the severe financial pressures, a result of increased operating costs from utilities, transport. Uh, uncertainty around staffing and so forth. So, so what we've tried to do is align that uplift with the Scottish Government adult social care uplift. Um, but there's also absolutely the question of affordability, and that's that's the budget that, that they've been offered um, for this for this financial year. Right. Thank you. That's helpful, Christine. My final question is this: this is probably my ignorance, so I'm sure you can tell me I shouldn't should be so stupid. But if you go, if you are currently being provided with a service from any of the categories that you've set out as an individual, and you go for option one, self-directed support, does the funding come from that figure that you presented here today, if they're currently going for option three or four, or does that come from another pot? No, that that this is this is the budget that we, this is the money that we pay quarterly to, um, to the providers. I don't know, Laura, if you want to come in on the specific question about MSTS, you're more in tune with that than I am. Uh, yeah, so Matt's hand up, so might be just about to say what he is. So, yeah, if they if they receive the service through option three, effectively we've paid for the service and we deliver the service. If they choose option one, they would be choosing a different. There'd be no reason to choose option one and buy the same support. Yeah, it would make no sense. So, if they were choosing option one and the outcomes we think can be delivered by this provider, but they're choosing a different provider or a different um, service, then that money would come from their kind of personal budget or the commissioning um, budget that, that Matt or Gillian holds for that service. So it would come from their 
uh, their commission budget rather than this one. So there would be money available. It is difficult though, because if we've tied our money into long contracts, um, as is the need um, of our commissioned services, then yeah. it does effectively go back to that block contracts, et cetera, et cetera. But there is that availability that we commission with our budget. And then if you're individually commissioning a service, then it would be through Matt or Gillian's um, commissioned budgets that that would happen. So thank you, Laura. And so, so just going back to the hopefully the more relevant point from a governor's perspective, I think that's a risk that we need to note because we're, yep. people have been encouraged down the option one route. And I think if that is if that encouragement is taken up, there could be an imbalance between what you've just described, which is a sensible approach, and how that budgetary management takes place over the coming years. Yes, I think that's right. Um, but I think the the I think people are should be encouraged to take option one when we can't deliver what they want. And if we're doing our jobs properly as commissioners, which I think we are, then we should be offering a range of services for people um, that meets their needs. Not talking about providers, but a range of services which allows them to to per, us to purchase what they want, so they don't have to choose option one and purchase something different or purchase a PA. But I, I take your point, Peter, and it is something we need to watch what's happening. If lots of people are choosing option one to purchase a service, we need to ask ourselves, why aren't we doing that for them? OK, does that answer the questions, Peter? Yes, it does. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Matt, Matt, did you want to come in on that point? Yeah, and I'm sorry I had some technical issues there, so I, I missed some of the conversation. But I think just it might be worth adding that the if I'm right in the context of the conversation was there a lot of what we're talking about here are probably almost not quite universal services, but services that are open to the general public and very easily accessible. The services that we commission on an individual basis are because of the specific needs of those individuals are probably greater. So I think there is probably a distinction between the between two groups of uh, service users and some in these services we're talking about here wouldn't necessarily go through that whole assessment and then discussion about options etc because they should be able to access these more readily themselves. Okay thank you thank you Matt and um, Andrew. Thank you uh, a technical question so so bear with me I'm I'm sure at the last uh, board meeting, it was said that our financial reporting is a, a quarter in arrears. I, I, with all the complexity of this commissioning arrangements, how are we assured that there aren't any, you know, in quarter or towards the end of the year challenges with how some of that money is being spent or or our governance procedures around it? And could that create an instability in the finances, particularly in year and in, and, and in future years? A bit, bit of a technical question. I, I might pick that up with Claire separately, but it, it, it was something that I was concerned about when I joined last time in terms of, you know, the, the governance around the financial reporting. Thank you, Andrew. Do, do Fiona or Claire, do you want to come on that one? Hi, hi, Andrew. Yeah, you can probably pick it up in, in slightly more detail um, when we when we catch up. But yeah, um, it does pose it does pose a risk. Um, but I suppose, um, given and we've got um, the team the team within the partnership that are kind of involved in the contracts and that kind of commissioning we've got a little bit of added extra resilience and support so we're not purely a reliance on on the, the the council finance function for this process we do have our the partnership have their own internal and in, internal resource that helps support that thank you okay does that help andrew yeah, sorry, sorry. Some of my questions are newness rather than an ignorance rather than no, uh, no, just so. all, all questions are fine. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments at all? Um, Lynn? Um, just in terms of the, the light touch on the older people's day centres, totally support that approach because obviously these are services that have been run for a very long time by um, God bless them, excellent volunteers within the community. I'm just conscious of having been involved in commissioning from, you know, uh, both commissioners and and um, potential service delivery. The support that the trustees will be getting in terms of involvement from VCEL um, and um, our own teams, will that include gearing them up to be able to deal with 
the rigours potentially of future commissioning processes? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, the, so to date, they've all had training through VCEL um, in terms of their their roles, responsibilities, um, the uncharitable law, etc. Uh, and they've been encouraged to allocate specific roles to trustees um, and and support the development of that. As part of the commissioning process, they've got to um, identify and develop a trustee development plan, which identifies their strengths and their weaknesses and areas for development. And part of that is understanding much more about the public procurement landscape and some of the challenges that might that might arise. Um, I don't know if Maureen, if we want to add anything more, particularly around the work that, that well, you've put your hand up anyway about the work that, that you've put your colleagues have been doing. Yeah, yeah, just to pick up what Christine's saying, I mean, we've been supporting them around about the business planning as well, mm -hmm. so that they're identifying their own risks, but they're also do, we're also doing um, health checks with them, which we hope to roll out across the, the sector. Um, in the next year, basically, so that you know, so we're doing the checks around about governance. We've managed to have conversations around about their their training programs and what was the other thing, Christine? So my mind went blank. The training programs and the the policies and procedures governance. and the HR support that that can yeah the governance bit that can come uh, through ourselves or SCVO. So the, there's a huge amount of work being done. Um, we're actually having a network associate, they sent a network association lunch, so they get to know us better as well as us getting to know them better. And actually moving forward, we'd really want to, to have a tight relationship with them because things are changing and we need to be as supportive as we can. So I don't know if that offers any comfort, Lan. Um, yeah, it does. There's, there's, I mean, obviously, the, the um, third sector interface role that you have there is absolutely crucial in making sure that these are sustainable services in the long term. So thanks for that. Okay, thank you. Um, Christine, can I just pick up on page 149, the, the three projects that you've mentioned, the grant funding has now ceased because it was only for a year. Can I just confirm that they've been contacted, that they're aware of that, and that from the comments that you've made, that you, you're saying that they now have... Um, funding to to cover. Yeah, absolutely. So as part, they had, there was a one year grant that they applied for, and as part of that, there's a closure process, um, and they're aware that that funding um, had ceased. Um, they have the opportunity to contact us and discuss additional funding. They haven't they haven't done so, but I am aware through um, another role that I have in terms of supporting VCEL with the Community Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund, that those organisations have received funding through that source. So um, they've had the funding, which is Scottish Government funding, they've had, uh, they've had funding through there. So. so the funding that they've had through another route is going to supplement the funding that was that was provided here. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't know the detail of each of the organisation's okay. finances, but they certainly haven't approached us for additional funding and they are still operational, the services, and they're still providing a service to the same same level as far as we're aware. Okay. Had they been contacted to to confirm that, that to confirm what to confirm that they don't they don't need it? Well, they would have been at the end of the grant process, yeah. Um, but okay. they haven't been in in contact, and then obviously it's up to their trustees, their small charities as well, to develop those plans to do, you know to apply for funding and so forth going forward. Okay. Um, okay. I've got Laura, and then Maureen, and then Marilyn. So it's really just to confirm. So if you remember that when we have grant um, applications, they are for a set period for a set piece of work, which the provider tells us they're going to do. And we monitor and check that they've done that. It's very clear at the beginning that that is a year process. Um, and yeah, I think, as, as Christine said, we are not in a position, certainly um, when we're looking at our budgets this year, to have a grant programme in place that was going to be um, uh, give us what we required for this year. So that's unfortunate, but we just yeah, are so tight with our budget as we move forward to sustain our current providers. Um, we just haven't got the flexibility anymore to be offering that grants programme, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and Maureen, did you want to come in on this point? Right, thanks. I mean, again, it was just to kind of reiterate what the, the ladies were saying. I mean, VCEL are providing support to all these organisations. It, it's worth remembering that Sport and Memories is a national organisation, um, which, you know, has a, a quite a good turnover themselves. Um, McMerry Men Shed, um, Tracy works really closely with them and they're looking at alternative funding um, and getting support with their application processes. 
And obviously you're aware the Connected Communities Managers are also supporting some of the work around about McMurray Men's Sheds. And Penny Pitt have, um, again, I've been applying successfully for further funding. The Community Mental Health and Wellbeing Fund is coming out again, so we'll have a, a third year of that, uh, which all these groups are able to apply for. Um, but again, it's, it's a year on year funding pot, unfortunately. But again, the process is that they, they, they're aware that it's a, a year on year funding and they have the three months wind down. So it's, it's really important that they work to their contract as well and, and take some responsibility. Um, but again, it's about encouraging the, the, the grassroots groups and the charities to be really aware of their expectations and our expectations on them. So I don't know if that is helpful or not, which you mean. Yeah, well, happy that's to pick helpful. This up with you later. Yeah, yeah, I'm ha happy to, to pick this up with yourself, Christine and Maureen. I think we just need to keep an eye on sometimes the funding that we provide is seed corn and enables them to then um, lever in. I always see that I've been able to lever in um, from, from elsewhere. So I think that's really important. But I think just for, for the paper, I'd pick up on the McMerry Men's Shed and the Penny Pit Community um, the trust with you, Christine, um, just to make sure that we're 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 keeping an eye out of what what's what's happening there, because I know that the Penny Pit is based in Preston Pans, and that's one you know one of the most deprived areas, um, in East Lothian and Mary Menshed, um, uh, the significant work they do in supporting health and well-being for for men in that area and, and the surrounding villages. Okay. Can I um, come back in there? Yeah. Sorry. So can I just come back in? I, th I think there's something here as, as well, and I hear what you're saying, Shemin, but there's also that bit about the, the organisation's responsibility. Um, it's seed corn funding to leverage the change. It isn't just a continual funding pot that they can get year on year. They have to take some responsibility, and that is what us as a TSI are supporting them, the organisations with. If they need further support, they should be able to come back to, to resale for that support rather than looking to the council um, to, to continue to subsidise this. So uh, again, I'm happy to pick this up with yourself and Christine. Yeah, I'm happy to pick that up. I think I'm aware that some of them are, are volunteers, so they, that there is support available for them, but just making sure that they're 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 taking that up and that we're aware that if, if they have any issues or any problems that we're, we're picking that up and, and supporting them. But most organisations are run by volunteers. Um, so I think there's there has to be equity across the piece. So you know if yep. we're offering to one organisation, we have to make sure that we're offering them to all. And Mary Men's Shed and Penny Pit, and um, we work really closely with. So just again, that's a wee bit reassurance for you that we are on them. Okay, well I'll 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 pick this up with yourself, Maureen and Christine. Okay, all right. Um, Marilyn, uh, this probably just shows my ignorance, but. Uh, I'm aware of a an organisation that organises transport for complex uh, disabled young people to go to events uh, once a week, for example, for some socialising. And the organisations have come to the area partnerships, the six area partnerships in the county for funding. Um, and uh, there's been a differential sort of result. Some area partnerships have funded the transport group and some haven't. And I'm just wondering how the what is the point of contact and how do um, organizations actually uh, approach uh, for funding? How do they find out about the grants, for example? I guess um, is not these weren't aware of these grants. I don't know if Laura and Maureen, if you want to come in, is that a question around the funding pots that are available and how they're able to access them, Marilyn? Yes. I, I can probably come in here uh, if you mean. Sorry, yeah, Laura, do you want to do it first? No, no, um, no, go ahead. I was just going to talk about the HSP. All, all the locality workers attend the area partnership meetings, eh, Marilyn, and they are fully versed in all the funding pots that's available out there. We, are also, we also actively encourage local organisations individuals um, to sign up to our, our bulletins, which contain fabulous information around about funding, uh, as well as other leg legislated, I can't even say that, but you know what I mean, um, concerns that, that, that may come up. So again, it's, we attend, I think, everything now because of the capacity that we have. Um, but again, Marilyn, if you know a group that is um, struggling just give me an email 
with some details and I'll pass it on to the relevant worker. Thanks so much, Maureen. Okay. Maura, I don't know if you wanted to come in on, on that at all. Uh, just uh, just, I suppose, just uh, again to clarify for the HSCP and when we're looking, so we don't have a grants programme anymore. Um, the one council have their partnership funding and that's widely analysed through their services. Um, for the for the partnership, for the health and social care partnership, we would normally see things coming up through the community into the change boards to then to the SPG and up to the IJB, which would um, give that kind of governance and, and then approach for commissioning or for, for finance. Um, we also uh, have our link workers within the health wellbeing groups, so um, programmes that are coming or ideas and initiatives that are coming there go directly to our strategy officers who then can support those organisations if they wish to make an approach to the partnerships. Okay, does that help Marilyn? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Is there any other questions or comments on this paper? No, just to thank Christine and um, and Andrew. I know you both of you have been working on this um, um, piece of work. It's really really significant the level of support that we provide the voluntary and community sector, and and again, then the the services that that they deliver that are around people centred. So I think this is a really um, important piece of work for the IJB to be um, discussing today and, and just seeing that the level of support and services that are out there that they're funding to support our, our local communities um, and also I think the fact that we've talked about must have been a day centre for, for quite a while so that's great news Christine of the work that you've put into of, of seeing that coming to fruition we know that's one of our biggest times we know that there's a need for that in, in Musselboro so it's great to see um, that coming forward and the plans to to see that in fruition um, for around about January 2024. But I think at the same time, we just need to make sure that we're supporting these groups. And I take on the point that you make, Maureen, but our levels of capacity within the volunteer and community sector in East Lothian are, are varied. So I know that that's really um, the locality workers are making a real difference to, to support those organisations to lever those funds in. But sometimes um, there's organisations like the, the partnership that provide that funding that enables them to leave it in other resources and on top of what we provide um, and making sure that those services are are further expanded and, and delivered. So I'm happy to, to approve this. So I think this is a roll call and I'll pass it on to, to Fiona. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the recommendations um, are as set out in the report from 2.1 to 2.4. Um, Shamin Akhtar. Agreed. Lachlan Bruce. Approved. Thank you. Andrew Cogan. Agreed. George Gordon. Agreed. Thank you. Fiona Ireland. Agreed. Lynn Jardin. Agreed. Carol McFarlane. Agreed. And Peter Murray. Agreed. Thank you very much. That's the recommendations approved unanimously. Thanks, Fiona. Move on to agenda item seven, which is the 23-24 draft and audited annual accounts. And that's Claire Flanagan. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So these are the draft um, unaudited annual accounts for the IGB for financial year 22-23. And the paper asks that the committee note the accounts, note that accounts were considered at the IGB's audit and risk committee on the 6th of June and ask the board to agree that these counts uh, can meet their legislative, legislative requirement and be published and presented for audit before the 30th of June. I'll talk you today through the main points in the document. So the accounts focus on the management commentary, which is the telling the story of the IGB during the financial year. It lays out the role and remit of the board and then presents the members of the board at March 23. The management commentary provides a summary of the operations of the IGB during the year and starts with um, the exit from the COVID, COVID funding. We reference the IGB strategic plan, so the new strategic plan for 22 to 25, reflecting the infrastructure supporting this development, these developments with strategic planning group and the change boards uh, that feed into them. We look to draw the operations of the draw out the operations of the IGB, and we highlight these under core hosted and set aside services, and we draw attention to a few areas of work. Um, particularly this time, we've referenced learning disabilities, substance use, 
mental health, uh, the new reprovisioning work, um, carers, care at home, primary care, physician associates and our East Lothian Rehabilitation Service and the work on going within telecare and pain management. Within the IGB's hosted services, the commentary notes the continued support of the IGB on the Royal Aid uh, de rede redevelopment and it notes the slower progress than anticipated just due, due to the challenges surrounding capital funding from NHS Lothian. We also reference the work that has been through the strategic planning group on uh, in terms of the Ashley Ainsley bed, the bed base. There was a paper presented there just earlier in the early in the year. And then we look at the set aside where we highlight the pressures within our acute hospitals and the work that the partnership continue to continue to support to try and support the support that pressure. We've made a particular reference this year to um, the East Lothian pilot for inreach. Um, which has been um, really successful um, so far, um, and um, it's led it's led by uh, Leslie Berry and our and our team. We then summarised the year end position, which resulted in a deficit of ten point one million pounds. A position which should be seen in the following the following context, and this is documented at the bottom of page eleven in the accounts. I'll just find out which page that is in everybody's part. Page 169 in the, in the pack. So the IGB did generate a surplus in 21-22. That surplus was the result of funding being given to the IGB by Scottish Government for use in financial year 22-23. Now a significant proportion of that funding equated to our COVID funding allocation. Therefore the deficit as a result of the IGB incurring expenditure against its earmarked reserves. The IGB's financial performance against its in-year delegated budget resulted in a small underspender surplus of £282,000 within social care. The health budgets of the IGB, so the overall health budgets, if we took them in totality, provided uh, generated a very small overspend of £31,000. And I'm, it's unfortunate that's an overspend, but given the scale of the budget, that's that's exceptionally, exceptionally good and resulted in some a uh, non-recurring um, financial support was provided by NHS Lothian just to break even the, the health, uh, the health budgets. We provide a summary of the movement in the IGB's reserves, which drives the deficit reported in the accounts. And you'll see there's been a significant movement in our reserves position uh, during the year, which we did anticipate. We knew the reclaim of the unrequired COVID funding was being undertaken. And we also knew that we had to utilise our earmarked reserves before drawing down any further funding from government. We provide the financial year end position by service area and provide an overview of the financial position by direct and pan loading services. And that's the large table within page 13 or page 171 on your pack. So it does highlight the operational uh, underspend, but it also uh, draws your attention to this areas that we still have significant financial challenges and financial pressures. And so specifically are with our prescribing budget, our general medical services budget, learning disabilities and set aside. We explain the IGB's challenges and the external, fans, uh, external factors. So uh, we mentioned the challenging budget offers we've had, the requirement for further savings uh, for the IGB, we reference the National Care Service, and then the risks and uncertainties, specifically re referencing um, the population growth and the workforce challenges. We then move on to the statement of responsibility. So a statement from the chair of the IGB and then myself as chief finance officer. This is followed by the remuneration report. Now, again, this report, this section of the, the accounts follows the same principles as we've done in previous years. So the IGB doesn't directly employ anybody. So in the remuneration report, we just uh, include um, the chief officer and the chief finance officer. And we split their remuneration between their roles on the IGB and their operational roles. We then move on to the annual governance statement, which is um, worth pointing out is um, in, uh, drafted by our uh, chief internal auditor. Um, and it does uh, provide reasonable assurance with the overall adequacy and we've got some actions uh, in scope for improvement. The next section of the accounts is the independent auditors report. Now that's left blank at this moment in time and that, that report will be inserted once the accounts have been audited and brought back at September time. So the document then moves on to the accounting statements themselves. So from page 185 in your pack, you'll see we've got an income and expenditure statement which highlights the 10.1 million deficit. We've then got um, the next accounts, which is the movement and reserves statement, which shows a closing reserves balance, um, shows our closing reserves balance for the financial year. 
And then at the bottom, it does break down our earmarked, our earmarked reserves um, for 23 that we've carried into 23, 24. This is all subject, obviously, to audit. And then we've got the IGB's balance sheet, which highlights the debtor's balance, which is ultimately just where our reserves sit in both our partners organisation, either NHS Lothian or um, East Lothian Council. The statements then are supplemented with notes. And if we get approval today, we'll, I will, these will be published and they will be presented for audit. Thank you, Claire. Can I just ask if anybody has any questions or comments? Fiona? Right, thanks, Claire. And as you said right up front, um, we did review the uh, um, draft accounts in the Audit and Risk Committee, I think on the 6th of June. Um, before they were they're brought to the IJB. But since then, there's been reference in the media about the standard of the financial controls in East Lothian Council. And um, I, I know we have this on our risk register. Well, we have our concerns around the um, financial support we get from East Lothian Council in the uh, risk register. And my question, therefore, is does this lack of confidence in the financial controls by Audit Scotland affect anything that we should be recording in our uh, accounts or in fact or or in our annual governance statement in the in the annual accounts so yeah i'm, I'm aware i'm aware of the the article uh, fiona i am not given i'm not a council employee i'm not um, fully immersed in in the detail around what some of those um some of those uh, risks uh, that were that were raised but what we do as an IGB, and we do this with both partners, is we rely on a letter of assurance. And this is something that our IGB external auditors require. So I would get a letter of assurance from the Director of Finance at NHS Lothian, and I get a letter of assurance from the Director of Finance at East Lothian Council. And that letter of assurance confirms the position and also uh, gives us assurance as an IGB that they have got adequate controls in place in terms of providing us with our financial, financial position. And given we don't have our own ledger system and we are relying on both partners, that is that letter is um, what we present to audit. Okay, Fiona, did you want to come back in? Can I follow back on that? Just just in terms of that letter of assurance, have we had that letter of assurance then? And did we get that letter of assurance prior to the Audit Scotland report reporting that they had a lack of confidence? We've not got the letter of assurance for 22-23 as, as yet. Um, that is something that when we when we start okay. um, engaging further, when once the accounts go to audit, then I start pulling together the working papers, and we'll have to probably chase for the letters. But yeah, we'll get that, them. That, that's that's so 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 that's yet to come, and that should reflect the Audit Scotland report, presumably if there's any elements of it affect us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're happy to follow. There'll be a, a a paper going to council on the on the audit Scotland report. So we're happy to 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 share that with with IGB members. And I know that finance have have uh, have put appropriate checks and balances in in place to address the, the issues that Audit Scotland have have highlighted. I don't know if there's any other question, Lynn. I just wanted to add that um, this issue also came up at um, last week's council meetings on. Audit and Governance and Policy and Performance Review Committee. So it's something that we are very mindful of. Okay, is there any other queries or questions? Just Claire, I just wanted to ask on page M171 um, around the, the set aside. I know it's one of the areas that we 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 talk about quite regularly of um of kind of getting a bit more detail of how that impacts on us and us in, in East Lothian so we know there's accident and emergency but I just wondered at what stage do you think of, that we would be able to to see how how that set aside impacts on us in East Lothian because I know there was a stage where um NHS were Lothian were looking at how um each of the partners were using the services and kind of reflect reflecting in that way. And I just wondered if you have any any kind of aware of any progress on that on that area. It was something, uh, Shamine, that was paused during the pandemic, and I would need to follow up in terms of where it sits on the NHS Lothian work uh, work plan. But it's I suppose it's also something that um, if we if we needed to, we could look at in pulling some data locally. It wouldn't be 
verified via NHS Lothian, but we do we are able to pull activity information um, locally as a partnership. So that is something that we could we could potentially do. Okay, I know that's an area that we we are overspent on, and it's an area that we'd want. And I know IGIB members would want to get a better understanding, even if it's that um, having information about the use uh, use of services, for example. Okay. Is there any other questions or Fiona? No, I'm, I'm just following on your, your comment, Chair, and I think it's a really reasonable point given the the work that we have done that some of it's um, showcased in the annual performance report, but also just the data that we know ourselves around our kind of bed usage, the direction of travel, and it, it's quite a live discussion through unscheduled care just now just around um, uh, from a from a partnership perspective and potential for IGBs to set directions on that kind of further change uh, around um, that kind of interaction of acute services and and how that supports kind of patients and for example East Lothian how do we sort people to be in an acute hospital when they need to be but actually support the direction of travel to support them back out and the impact of how we use our bed base so I don't know Claire I know we had a discussion and with Graham Maguire, who was a representative from um, Acute Finance. I wonder if there's something just exploring taking that back, because it's a, a reasonable question from an IGB perspective that, that often we present to partner or our partners and say, this is what we're doing. But actually, it would be helpful, perhaps something, a presentation, and it might need to be combined um, a, for for the IGB. And if if Chair, if you just let us explore it a bit further, but I think I think that's a it's a really reasonable uh, point. I think it would be a, a, a positive thing to do. OK, we'll, we'll take that down as an as an action point. Just want to see if there's any other questions or queries. I don't see any other hands just to um, to thank Claire and other um, finance colleagues for the annual report. And I think you've you've mentioned for the budget that we have and and overall you've mentioned the level of, of overspend was it 31,000 to have that level of overspend with the, the, the totality of the budget just shows how hard staff across the piece are working um, to operate within the budgets that have been set. And I suppose the performance report tells you that the results those staffs are delivering on a staff members are delivering on a, on a daily basis um, and the, the the drivers, the finances speak behind that. And I think we're all cognizant of the level of growth that, that's taking place within East Lothian and the challenges that face um, all our partners and how the, the importance of, of working together and you pooling those resources as effectively as possible for the for the best possible outcomes for, for our community. So if, if that could be passed on to Claire, because I know that will be a, a, a myriad of people behind you that will also be supporting this 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 process from from both partners and just to to thank them for that report just to, and it's a helpful overview for for us to get and then delve down into some of the areas that we've talked about such as the the, the set aside of the services that we use and the the purpose of integration was to look at shifting those and um, shifting those that that balance and making sure that people are have those services available in, in, the, in the local community so thank you for that um, I know that this will be a, a roll call, so I'll pass it on to you, Fiona. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, the recommendation is as set out in 2.1, which is to note the accounts um, that were considered at Audit and Risk Committee and to agree that they should be, the draft annual accounts can be published and presented for audit. Um, Shmeen Akhtar. Agreed. Lachlan Bruce. Lachlan. Agreed. Thank you. Andrew Cogan. Agreed. George Gordon. Agreed. Thank you. Fiona Ireland. Agreed. Lynn Jardin. Agreed. Carol McFarlane. Agreed. And Peter Murray. Agreed. Thank you. That's the recommendations approved unanimously, Chair. That's great. Thank you very much. That's um that's our meeting concluded. So I want to thank everybody for their tip. For their participation and their and their contribution today and um we will see you at the next integration joint board meeting and i hope to catch you and um, in between those meetings okay thank you very much thank you thank you can you Thanks, switch fiona. the recording off fiona bye bye